Hi everyone, my name is Stefan Wiefling and I'm from the Data and Application Security Group of HBRS University of Applied Sciences. And look what I got here. Let's see. Yeah, here. It's a bag that we got here last year at Internet Dagena and it was a very great time because uh, I love it being at PasswordsCon having these great conversations. Unfortunately, this time it's online, but uh, I'm just trying to reproduce the PasswordsCon feeling as good as possible. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me again here. And um, the talk that I'm just giving, going to give you here today is about risk-based authentication. And last year there were some questions like, uh, how's the usability actually of risk-based authentication? And now I can finally provide answers on that because we did multiple studies and uh, yeah, some of them will be published very soon and some of them already did. So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and we're just talking about passwords. I mean, passwords are just deployed everywhere and we can't get away with them, uh, hopefully, because then I just can give some talks at PasswordsCon and if they go away, that would be very bad for us. <laughs> and yeah, uh, just to be honest, I mean, uh, we already know why and uh, yeah. But however, the risk in uh, password-based authentication just increased uh, all over the years with uh, password database leaks because we have like password databases from popular online services, they got stolen and now as you as an attacker can just get them from the internet and uh, yeah, just automatically enter these username and password combinations on the website over and over again, like trying user one, user two, user three. And, you know, we're just humans and we're just reusing passwords. I'm sometimes reusing passwords. So uh, hackers will be successful at one part. And uh, this is why credential stuffing attacks, so this is called credential stuffing, that these attacks are just at a high degree, uh, as you can see here. So they're very popular. So we need to implement somehow additional uh, measures just to protect our users from these attacks. And uh, if you at least in Germany ask people about how to protect users from these attacks, they always say like, yeah, use two-factor authentication. Yeah, that seems like a sensible idea. But the problem is here that the user acceptance seems to be very low regarding that. Uh, Google themselves really had to say that less than 10% of their active Google users uh, have just opted in for two-factor authentication, which is a very low number. Uh, if you just remember, Google just started promoting 2FA since 2011, so that's a very long time span and it's just 10%, that's a very low number. So you really need to protect these 90% that don't have 2FA enabled. And in this case, you can use risk-based authentication. And that's what online services like Google are doing, actually. So um, it works as follows. So you're just a user um, typing in your username and password at a website. And when you submit the login form, you're also submitting additional metadata that is available in the context. This could be, for example, what kind of IP address am I using? What kind of device am I using? And so on. And all this information is just compared with your previous login history and in the backend and RBA then just calculates the risk. How highly it is that this login attempt is a hacking attempt and this is just normally categorized into low, medium and high risk. If you're just taking a low risk example, I'm just signing in from a university as I normally do. And since this, this is the normal login behavior, I'm just getting uh, signed in as always. And But now I'm just switching to another location. Just take Stockholm, for example. Okay, uh, that looks a bit weird. Um, let me correct it a little bit. Now it's correct. So um, yeah, we just went to Stockholm in this case and I'm using a device that I've never used before. And uh, yeah, since this is not my normal user behavior, RBA is not quite sure and it says, okay, is it really Stefan Miefling trying to sign in here? Uh, so they're just asking for an additional authentication factor that I can give to them to prove that this is really me. And in most cases, this is like an email with a six digit code that I just enter on the website. And if that proof is correct, that I'm just getting signed in. And uh, yeah, online services are using it. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, you can check out my passwords con talk from last year. Um, there are, we did some studies just to figure out who's using it. And we found out that Google is using it, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and Amazon is using it among others. 
and also NIST is recommending it um, in the NIST Digital Identity Guidelines. If you haven't read these guidelines before, just do it. There are a lot of usable security principles implemented there, so that's a really interesting read for you, I guess. Uh, however, we still have a problem that we haven't investigated at the time when we concepted the studies, because RBA it might be used on websites, but we don't know how the usability is. And this could be a problem because um, we have like unpredictable system behavior because sometimes you ask for additional authentication and sometimes you're not. And this is why we constructed and designed a study uh, just to investigate the usability and security perceptions of risk-based authentication. Um, you will get, actually, this will be published at the EXEC conference in December. So you get a preview of that. Um, so. Yeah, we constructed a study just to investigate uh, how the security and usability perceptions are. And um, yeah, just to do that, we designed a cloud storage website uh, where you can do stuff that you can do on a cloud storage website, like uploading and downloading data. You can take a picture of yourself, uh, which is cons uh, which is sensitive data actually in Germany. So this is interesting to know or important to know here. Um, so data sensitivity could be high on this website. And we tested the website by in, um, introducing the website to our participants as an external website. So yeah, this is a cloud storage website. We would like to know uh, how you think about that. It is not linked. The study website was not linked to our university just to avoid bias. And yeah, they registered with their personal devices on the website. Um, so they used their private email address and the device their private devices, so to create a realistic study scenario here. And when they signed into the website, they perceived one of four authentication methods. So per each participant, it was one of four um, authentication methods they perceived. So we selected them and everyone perceived one of them. And uh, yeah, if we were just, we had a condition where all participants where the participants in the condition were asked always for additional authentication. So this is just like to classical two-factor authentication. And we also tested two different variations of RBA. One was always triggered when the device was different. And the other one was always triggered when the location uh, was new and different. So this is what we also found in the wild. So just to reproduce it here and also to have some comparison to, you know, uh, the classical password only authentication, we had a condition where we never asked for additional authentication, just to compare it. Um, we had a challenge in our study design also because authentication is always uh, as a secondary test. You have one test, for example, like logging in into a cloud storage website. And then while you're doing that, the authentication method gets into the way. So just to investigate that, we needed to design tasks, uh, realistic tasks, which, uh, yeah, are not uh, the authentication method. So we never said that we were testing authentication methods to avoid bias. Um, and we designed seven tasks. They solved these seven tasks using their private device. So they have one private device and they switched the location and used two different devices they have never used before in that case. And the task also introduced some sensitive data just to increase, increase the immersion to the scenario. And to also support more the immersion into the study scenario, we introduced room changes in our study. Um, room one they used, where they used their private devices, was just a normal study room, which they knew from the university. So just like a normal boring office room. And then we just asked them after some tasks to switch the rooms. And when they entered the new room, they were a little bit like shocked because they never knew a room that looked as beautiful as this one at the university. <laughs> just trust us. So this method also helped um, participants to uh, increase the immersion into the study scenario here. And in this case, as you see, the location-based RBA was triggered. Uh, so that we also introduced these tasks just to perceive the differences between uh, the authentication methods. Um, so after they finished the task, we wanted to figure out how are their actually usability and security perceptions. So uh, we designed an exit survey, which they answered. Um, they included some usability and security perceptions here that we measured. So we wanted to measure that, of course, how people perceive it. And uh, after that, 
um, we wanted to figure out why did the participants cross certain answers. So uh, we also did a semi-structured interview here. So we asked them some questions. Why did you choose certain answers? And uh, also wanted to figure out their personal experiences with websites. So perhaps they perceived REA. So we wanted to get gather that information here. And these are our results. Um, we had a young population, 65 participants. Uh, it's more skewed to a male population, but we also had female persons and one person that did not state the gender in our study. So uh, it's also, yeah, a young population here. And the results that we had here, uh, we also measured the usability using the system usability scale. Um, these are 10 standardized questions and uh, how, depending on how they answer the question, um, they, we calculate a score between 0 and 100 and the higher the score, the higher the usability. And you can clearly see here on the graph that uh, the usability of 2 of A was significantly lower than password only and risk-based authentication. Um, regarding the uh, user acceptance, we could see that uh, the user acceptance of RBA was significantly higher than those of 2 of A. So, but the, pro but the difference here that we saw is that the acceptance differs on the use case scenario that we actually have here, because um, it really depends uh, on what's the re-authentication factor you're offering, and also what is the data sensitivity in that use case scenario. So what kind of data is stored on the website and how sensitive do participants consider it? Because uh, that's what we also asked in our survey. So we asked them if they were willing to use um, this authentication method on certain websites and also uh, if they were willing to if to use it uh, if they had to give um, their personal email address for this purpose. And in this case, the acceptance was overall pretty high. But when we asked for a phone number, this acceptance really declined. And you can see here on the graphs that uh, for online banking, the acceptance is really high also here. Maybe this is just a German kind of thing, but also the uh, willingness to use an app was also quite similar. And also in terms of online banking, purple, people were really willing to use 2 of A also in that case. So they were also willing to accept being annoyed a little bit, but have more security. As But there are differences here, as you can see, on websites with lower sensitivity, people preferred uh, other authentication methods here and other authentication factors. Um, there are also more factors as we get some insights here in our interview questions. So what are also factors influencing the acceptance of 2 of A of, or RBA? One of them is the trust in the online service. One participant was not willing to give the phone number again to a social media website because, uh, yeah, the person just offered it, uh, the phone number, and was then not only asked for additional authentication via this uh, text message they received and they also advertised and, and spammed them a lot. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, so the trust in the online service is, seems to be very important here. And also the device involved. There was one person that used Netflix and uh, when signing in, Netflix asked, uh, triggered sometimes from, for RBA and uh, yeah, do you have an email account on installed on your television screen? I guess not. Um, that's a pretty dumb idea, I think. And this is also why this person was quite annoyed when Netflix asked for additional authentication. So you really need to care about what's also the device involved here. Regarding the security, we can see a clear tendency when you ask for additional authentication at least once, people feel more protected. And this is a good sign also for RBA, uh, which you can see here. So the acceptance, uh, this perceived security was significantly higher for 2 of A and RBA uh, in that terms, uh, in that cases here. Uh, we also had some additional findings in our study, some problems that uh, happened actually when uh, yeah we, we had did the study here. So we asked for additional authentication via email in the 2 of A and RBA conditions when they were triggered. And um, some of our participants, because we asked them to use their private email address, some of them use Gmail. Yeah, so they signed in into their Google accounts. And when they had a different device or location, Google also had RBA enabled. Yeah, sure, because we had <laughs> Google is using RBA as we know before. And the problem is here, if you don't have your device uh, with you to confirm it, 
you're getting locked out of your account. So this is not a good option here. And the problem is here that uh, one fifth of our participants really had this problem and didn't have their device in this special room. Um, so we really, really need to tackle that. And they also had negative experience where it really happened in the past, especially when the battery is flat and you couldn't have another device to do, confirm it. This is a pro This was a problem here. and. Um, also with shared accounts, this seems to be a problem. So really need to tackle that if you're an RVA developer or deployer. So really need to care about what is the second factor you're actually offering here for re-authentication. Uh, so after we figure out uh, what's the usability of RBA, we did another additional study um, just to figure out uh, more about re-authentication methods. Because um, if you watched the PasswordsCon talk from last year, you know that using the email uh, as a verification factor seems to be the state of the art um, regarding risk-based authentication and also using a six-digit code in the email. Um, however, we thought uh, if you're using different devices for verifying, like you sign in on a desktop device and have a mobile phone with you, it takes it could take more time when verifying. So we're just wondering why they're not online services are not using other methods than these six-digit codes in the email body. So we investigated that by constructing a study um, just to investigate how actually uh, if there's a potential to improve this method here. So yeah, it's a similar study procedure as the last time. They registered on the website and after that, we just asked when they signed in uh, on the website for additional authentication. And the login method differed between each condition. So we had three conditions here. And um, condition one was they had re to re-authenticate with the state-of-the-art deployments that we know from practice. So email in the... Uh, code is in the body and not in the email header. And uh, since we already saw it on email registering um, purposes on some websites, we were just wondering, why don't you just put the code inside the email header? And this is what we did in the second condition. So this is not the case in RBA right now. And um, so, yeah, we put the code in uh, the email header. So this was condition two. And since we also knew it from last year, there were some talks about magic links. So, and since people are always propagating magic links as the future and authentication, um, we were also thinking about, yeah, you could also construct something like magic links perhaps for risk-based authentication, but we really adapted it for our special scenario in order to prevent prefetching um, links that could, if you just, so you had a link that you just click here, and uh, just to verify that it's, uh, yeah, if you're using a different device, just to make sure um, we had an extra confirmation here when you're using the mobile phone to confirm it, which could be the case here. You're also asked just to click on, um, on yes here, just to confirm it, similar to a Google dialog here. And then you just confirmed and getting signed in on your main device. And uh, what's a fun fact about that? One year after we did the study and after our pap paper was already accepted, um, yeah, this uh, we just found it that Amazon really deployed this method. So just in the way as we designed it, so you have to click the link, confirm it, and then you're signed into Amazon. So we, so you basically now can find some results on stuff that is also widely or deployed at least at one online service, just to figure out how people perceive it. Um, just to compare these methods, we measured the times, how long it takes uh, to finish the study. Um, so the time one that we measured was how long does the re-authentication time take in total. And the second one, uh, second time that we measured was how long does the uh, finishing the login challenge itself take. Just to confirm um, in terms of usability how they really perform. And these are our results. And uh, you can see here, um, yeah, we had a young population. So not, not a young population, we had a diverse population here. We, had, we did the study via Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, which is an online platform just uh, to pay participants to finish a study. And since this was a reactional study, uh, it worked quite good for our study purpose. Uh, we had a diverse population between gender and also the age, uh, which is quite good. Um, and we had some differences here actually in how the authentication methods perform. Um, it was it performed faster in two cases. Um, one case was when we had code-based re-authentication 
um, when using the desktop PC for signing in and re-authentication, so it's on the same device, um, the code-based challenges were so faster. And based on our analysis, it took faster because, uh, yeah, it they just copied and pasted the code actually here. And on link-based re-authentication methods, um, it performed faster when the devices were different. So if you're just taking your mobile phone out and just, uh, yeah, completing the challenge here, it was faster when you were just using the mobile phone. So there were some performance improvements. However, if you take it in total, um, it wasn't that fast, the link-based method. So we were a little bit disappointed here, but the code-based method, so if you're having the, uh, the code in the email header, it really had an effect and a significantly faster uh, challenge, uh, the re-authentication time was significantly faster in that respect. Um, we also wanted to measure the sentiment because it's also a factor accepting it if users are accepting it. So uh, we did similar to uh, Max who did it on another purpose. We just asked the participants to state three feelings they had when they verified their identity. And uh, yeah, it was a free answer. And after that, we uh, yeah filtered these answers and ranked how often they were mentioned. And uh, across all the three conditions, it was just quite, yeah, we have positive feelings, negative feelings, but also overall, they are quite similar here. Uh, but we really had uh, some differences between the conditions, uh, which were quite interesting. One of them was, um, if you're just using a link-based method, the people were significantly more scared, uh, more anxious here in that case. And uh, why is that? Uh, Based on the replies we got, uh, we think that this could be due to phishing awareness campaigns. So they know not to click on links and now we're just asking them to do the opposite. So uh, yeah, this is why people are not tend to accept it right here. And also um, if you're just using the code based methods, um, if you're using the code in the email body and subject line, it really had a positive effect because people were significantly less nervous, maybe because we could, they didn't need to answer, uh, to open the email, just uh, to open the email, because they knew what to expect here. So this could be also why it had a positive effect here. So just to conclude, regarding the overall reusability perceptions, we saw that RVA um, performed better in terms of usability than uh, comparable to factor authentication methods. Also, the security of uh, risk-based authentication is significantly higher than password-only authentication, but you really need to be careful about how you implement risk-based authentication. Regarding the re-authentication methods, we saw that uh, using the email code in the header and the body had a positive effect. So this was a clear winner because also the participants were significantly less nervous in that respect. We were a little bit disappointed uh, regarding the link-based re-authentication method. We had better expectations here, but however, um, the overall effects that we had here showed that it wasn't a good idea to implement it right now. Um, but regarding the winner that we had here, it is not the current state of the art. So we would like to uh, appeal to uh, website owners just to revise probably their current RVA implementations. So at the end, uh, we can say that you should consider RBA on websites with sensitive data involved. Only exception is online banking, because in this term, uh, in this case, uh, users were tending to accept 2FA more to feel more secure, uh, because they are, even though they were annoyed in that respect a little bit. Um, as we saw, email based re authentication, yeah, it's probably not the best method here, but uh, depending on your service, it seems to be mostly accepted but you really have to care about what kind of, um, how do you actually implement the method? And you really need to be aware of deadlocks. What is the additional authentication factor you're offering? Is there a fallback method somehow? Um, because as you saw in the Gmail example, it could be a very big problem if you don't get into your website and you're a legitimate user. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure just to be here back again at PasswordsCon 2020, this time online. Uh, if you've got any more questions, just drop me a line on Twitter. Um, just g give me some uh, questions in the chat right now if you're live uh, watching this one or I'm contactable via email as well. Or we have a website actually where we also collect more information on risk-based authentication. We do multiple studies and we did some. So just go onto a website, riskbasedauthentication.org just to figure out more. And I'm very happy right now to uh, 
forward and uh, very looking forward just to answer your questions. So thank you very much.